Welcome to Studies with Stearman. Join us as we look deeper into the Bible. Strengthen your faith with us, even as we see the day approaching. And now, here's Gary. Hello, I'm Gary Stearman. Welcome to another study. Today, following a pattern we've set up for a few weeks now, we're going to look at what I think is an extremely important chapter of the Bible. This one may be the most important, although, (laughs) as I've said repeatedly, uh, you can't say that any chapter of the Bible is more important than any other. We're going to be looking at the first chapter of Revelation. And before we do, let's uh, have a moment of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that uh, you have made it understandable and completely uh, sensible from our perspective so that it fits beautifully together and tells us exactly what uh, you have done for us and what we have uh, by way of expectation. We just thank you for your word and we pray in Jesus' name. Looking at Revelation 1, verse 1, I'm going to read the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. One thing that's really noticeable uh, right at the beginning here, he's talking about things which must shortly come to pass and then Uh, he goes ahead and gives a a very complete outline of the things to come. Now they haven't come for us yet. John wrote this a couple thousand years ago and yet it says things which must shortly soon come to pass. This gives you a little idea of biblical perspective. Uh, I'm pre-trib pre-mill, dispensational, somebody asks me, uh, uh, do you expect Jesus to come soon? And I always say, yes, very soon. (laughs) Well, but how soon? Well, soon, perhaps before I finish this sentence. Well, this is the biblical perspective of time. Things which must shortly come to pass. When, When John wrote this, it would still be a couple of millennia before these uh, things uh, would come to pass. And yet we look at them as Christians uh, as being soon in nature. Is he coming? Soon. Uh, When is he going to judge the world? Very soon. Uh, 2,000 years later, we're still saying soon. Now that's one thing about the, the, the first verse of Revelation 1. The other thing is <clears throat> uh, the opening words of this book announce something very, very interesting. The, the very opening words of verse 1 say this, the revelation of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> That's the title of this book. The last book in the Bible is called the book of the revelation or the just the book of Revelation. But what are, you, what are you looking at when you look at the Revelation? If you look at this thing in Greek, the first three words are apocalypsis Jesu Christu, the revelation of Jesus Christ in English. Very, very simple. That very first word, apocalypsis, has come into the English language as Apocalypse. Now, if you look at the way uh, people use that word today, they misuse it all the time. Uh, They use the word apocalyptic, and usually if you uh, uh, put together a a a two-and-a-half-hour sci-fi movie, uh, somewhere in the the, the advertising copy for that movie, you're going to have, the apocalypse is coming. Well, what is the apocalypse? It's the first word in the book of Revelation. In fact, that's the name of this book, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. 
uh, in English, the revelation of Jesus Christ. But what is an apocalypse? An apocalypse means now you see it and you pull aside the veil <laughs> and now you see it in an entirely different way. In other words, we read this and we have a vision of what we're seeing in Revelation just by virtue of having studied it for a while. But even as you read it, you understand that you're really not seeing that which is to come. And it's still partially veiled. The veil is going to be pulled aside and then there will be the revealing of Jesus Christ. To, to us who follow him, uh, he is revealed to the extent that our faith is completed, but he's not revealed yet anything like he will be. And so you go back to chapter 1, the, re the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly, that is soon, come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. We'll find uh, uh, in a few verses that that angel is the angel of the Lord. <clears throat> that is the Lord coming as messenger. And I have to stress, and I'm going to repeat this several times, Revelation is both the name and the purpose of this book, to reveal the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you have not received the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ and received His Spirit, you will not in any way be able to fathom what's going on here because it takes the leading of the Spirit really to understand the Word of God more so uh, as uh, comes when you study Revelation. Or should I say the apocalypse, the revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ. And again it's an apocalypse which must shortly, that is, and by the way the word translated shortly here is the, the Greek word takis. We get our word tachometer from that, that Greek word. And a tachometer is on your instrument panel, tells you how fast the engine is running. And it has the general connotation of speed. And so <laughs> right here in the first verse uh, of Revelation, <clears throat> the revelation of Jesus Christ, that is the unveiling, the revealing, and don't ever use the word apocalypse to mean a disaster or like a volcanic eruption or a shed full of dynamite accidentally blowing up. And everybody says, ooh, it's the apocalypse. Now apocalypse doesn't mean an explosion or a volcano or a hurricane. It means to reveal. And so that's what we're going to be doing. And it, in fact, that's what the whole Bible does. <clears throat> Verse 2. The servants and the angel. Verse 2 says, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. And so beginning with the idea of revealing, we quickly follow it with the idea of a revealing angel, which we'll see just a little bit later, and of course that's the, the pre-incarnate uh, Christ. And also it is the risen Christ, and, and that's really important. And he's called an angel here, that is a messenger to the servant John. Verse 2, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and all the things that he saw. Verse 3, blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. I, I, we've gone through the first three verses here. What have we got? We've got speed. We have uh, a message signified by an angel. We have a record. And we have the time of all this being, as the Bible puts it, at hand. In other words, the idea of imminency is, uh, is pronouncedly laid out in the first three verses of this, uh, of this book. 
quickly and fully. And it has been verified. Now we've gone through the first three verses. The revelation, the signification by the angel of the Lord. We have a blessing given here for those who read this book. And right at the end of verse 3, the little phrase, the time is at hand. How quickly is all this coming? Like that. Very, very quickly. In other words, throughout the entire church age, Christians have been urged to look at Christ's coming as that which may happen at any moment. Now, it may come to you personally. Uh, if you're walking under a cliff and a boulder falls on you, it's done. <laughs> it's happened. <laughs> that is to say, in the, in the respect that you may pass on at any moment, it certainly is at hand. In the opposite respect, that he may come at any moment, it's also certainly at hand. But whatever the case, you should live your life as though uh, Jesus could come in the very next moment. <clears throat> Now we begin. Verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia. <clears throat> now, uh, the Apostle Paul uh, familiarized us with all the cities of Asia, uh, which sometimes called Asia Minor. But the seven churches uh, of Asia Minor uh, are uh, greatly uh, of great importance, I should say because they lay out the, the long and complex development of the church over the last 2,000 years. It's fascinating that this book is written as though it could happen in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, but it's also laid out over a very, very long period as we look back. And so time from the Lord's view is something that we humans have a great deal of trouble with. Uh, for us, time is the second hand on a watch. For the Lord, time is His program. And we try our best to understand it. And sometimes it's frustrating. Sometimes it's, it leads to mistaken perceptions like Jesus is coming next week. Well, next week comes and, and goes, and Jesus doesn't come. This has been going on for centuries, and still it goes on, and still it will go on, because when his view of time is, is uh, built more on the achievement, the accomplishment of various goals throughout the church age rather than a ticking clock. And I think that's the way the Lord looks at humanity. What are you doing? Are you, what, are you, what have you done in my name? And that's the theme that runs all the way through Revelation. John to the seven churches which, which are in Asia. And if you look at a map uh, of Asia Minor and the seven churches, <clears throat> you see that, that they lie at the west end of Asia Minor. Look at, look at a, a, a map in the back of your Bible and you'll see this. And the seven churches of Asia Minor form a little circle. And the circle uh, pretty much matches the way the churches are depicted in Revelation. <clears throat> Grace be unto you and peace from him which is, which was, uh, which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before the throne. Uh, we see the seven spirits uh, later uh, at the revealing of Christ uh, at the great uh, executive council, if you will, during which time uh, the risen Christ receives the seven seal scroll and opens it, thereby judging planet Earth. But when you look at this, seven spirits before the throne, it, it, it goes to a larger picture. Verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests 
unto God and his Father. To him be glory, dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The idea of the Amen is the idea of pulling everything together into one and that one is centered uh, upon the very heart of God. Amen. <clears throat> we have then uh, opened the, the book. We have opened or we have begun to reveal Jesus Christ because that's what this book is, the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is the revealing. It is the apocalypse. And thank God He's made us kings and priests unto God and His Father. To Him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Verse 7, Behold, He cometh with clouds. Hmm. Where have I ever heard that? I think if I turn back uh, uh, to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Verse 16, and I'm going to read something we've all read a dozen times, maybe a hundred times. For the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So you go back to the book of Revelation. <clears throat> And you read here in verse 7, Behold, He cometh with clouds. Amen. <laughs> he does. And every eye shall see Him. Oh, my goodness. Now, there's a, a lot going on be between the first and the second phrase in this verse. Number one, He comes with clouds. Number two, every eye shall see Him. <sighs> to us, the Lord's going to be revealed in the rapture. To those who do not go in the rapture, after that an amazing series of events comes to pass and you come to the end of uh, this book and the Lord does come with clouds and every eye shall see Him. That's not the, uh, that's not the rapture. That is the revelation, the revealing and that's what this whole last book of the Bible is all about, the revealing of Christ to the world. And they will fall down on their faces and worship Him. But, as you know, Revelation is very, very complex and contains numbers of events that have yet to come to pass. Behold, He cometh with clouds, every eye shall see Him, they also which pierced Him, all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so. Amen. At the second coming of Christ, there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. At his coming in the clouds, for us, there will be shouts of joy, and amen, and hallelujah, because we're going to go up and we're going to be given immortal bodies and we will rule and reign with Him from that point forward. Verse 8 here says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, which is to come, the Almighty. The risen Christ is God incarnate. The thing which I think drives me, which propels me through Scripture, is the moment by moment uh, unveiling, if you will, in my own eyes, the extent to which Jesus is God. A lot of times he's looked at as a person, a wonderful person, a person who came to did a number of things uh, and, and then was crucified. But if the entire picture, if you look at the entire picture of the life of Jesus, the fact that, that he walked in shoe leather in Galilee moment by moment living a planned life right up to the time of his crucifixion. <clears throat> 
when you begin to see God walking in shoe leather and you, you make that a reality in your own life, that is to say, you say I, I, he walked the same way I'm walking right now. And he experienced trouble the same way I'm experiencing trouble right now. And you are too. Uh, life can have its frustrations. For Jesus, life had many frustrations. Let's just put it this way. There are a lot of people that didn't really like him at all. And yet, what is he? What is he? Alpha, Omega, beginning and ending which is, was, is to come, the Almighty. And the idea of God in human flesh, I will never fully comprehend that as long as I live. Uh, the complexity of it, the, uh, uh, the amazing, if you will, self-release, the idea that God gave up his glory, and to condescend and walk among human beings, is, it still staggers my mind every time I think of it. Verse 9, I, John, who also am your brother, companion in tribulation, <clears throat> and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, uh, which was in the isle that's called Patmos, for the word of God and for a testimony of Jesus Christ. He was imprisoned there, <clears throat> miraculously uh, escaped and he, he lived out the rest of his life as the bishop of Ephesus. Uh, but that Isle of Patmos imprisonment, can you imagine uh, John, the beloved John who wrote Revelation having to go through jail and, and some say he was tortured grievously. Uh, there are uh, historical notes that he was boiled in oil and miraculously uh, escaped from that. Although that would be a real miracle, wouldn't it? <laughs> yes, it would. I, John, who am also your brother, that's the way he starts verse 9, <clears throat> companion in tribulation. So if you're having some tribulation out there, remember John, <laughs> he's your companion in tribulation. And the patience of Jesus Christ. He was in the Isle of Patmos for the Word of God, for testimony of Jesus Christ. And he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. What is the Lord's Day? That's the first day of the week, the day that He arose and has been celebrated as such <clears throat> ever since Pentecost. And He says, I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. You know, every time God speaks, it always sounds like a trumpet. And it's a trumpet that is articulated. That is to say, it, it can speak words. I've never heard of a trumpet like that. But I really want to hear that trumpet. I want to hear a trumpet saying, come on up. Uh, in English would be nice. But if, if it happened to be in Greek, that would be okay too. Because he'd figure out a way for me to understand that. A voice as of a trumpet, and the voice said, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest write in a book, send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, <clears throat> Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Verse 12, after naming the churches, John writes this, and I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and I, I, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Now, uh, the golden candlestick, that is the temple menorah, was always in the holy place. And when you walked into the holy place, uh, you would look to your left, left and see the uh, seven-branched menorah which was kept illuminated 24 hours a day, seven days a week by the priesthood. <clears throat> the menorah goes all the way back, by the way, to uh, Aaron. And uh, Aaron, uh, if you recall, as Moses, uh, I suppose, ambassador, if you will, representative, always carried an almond rod and the almond rod uh, was uh, a rod ordained of God from the holy mountain 
and the almond rod miraculously budded even after it had been cut and prepared as a walking stick. The life of the Lord, the seven candlesticks. I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, clothed with the garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. The seven golden candlesticks were uh, uh, decorated with uh, the almond buds. <clears throat> and so we have the story of, that goes from the giving of the law all the way up to the future, that is to say that which has not happened yet, that is the, the, the menorah, the, the full, if you will, um, uh, blooming of Aaron's rod that budded ha- has, not, has not been complete yet. We're still waiting for all that to happen. His head and his hair were white like wool and white as snow. His eyes were as a flame of fire. So here's the risen Christ. In the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, clothed the garment down to the foot. He was clothed around his chest uh, with a garment that went down to his feet. And it was tied in some way with a sash that was made of gold. And we can only imagine what that looked like. His head and his hair were white like wool, white as snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass as they burned in a furnace, and his voice like the sound of many waters. Think of a waterfall, like standing uh, below Niagara Falls, and that's the sound of his voice, uh, which would get your attention. Verse 16, and he had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Now, I don't think that we're looking here at an an actual metal sword that he's holding in his teeth. I think what, what we have is the solidification of matter and energy or, or sound into uh, some kind of matter that could be perceived. In other words, his voice has such power that it actually takes on physical characteristics. You have to see it to really understand it. I haven't seen it. But when we do finally see a command going out of the mouth of God that is so powerful that it can actually be uh, perceived by sight, now that's going to be something. And his countenance was as the sun shining in his strength. Amazing. Verse 17, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth, was dead, I am, and behold, I am alive evermore, forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and death. And what's important about that is judgment is coming. When our Lord appears to John and, and He says, I have the keys to hell and death. What he's really saying is, I am the judge. I have the power to open up uh, that place, of that hideous place uh, of evil and lost spirits. And Satan and his followers, all the evil that is yet to be judged, even as we're reading this right now. And he says, I have those keys, meaning I can open up Hades and I can judge all of what has been imprisoned there for thousands of years. Verse 19, write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, the things which shall be hereafter, the things you've seen, things which are, that which shall be hereafter. He is the Lord of time. He looks across time the same way that you and I would look out a window and and see what we see there. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. That is the 
the guiding and leading spirits of those seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are seven churches. <clears throat> so the churches are arranged and in the next chapter, chapter 2, uh, the seven churches will be examined, will be placed in perspective, and will become an amazing prophecy. Uh, essentially, uh, as John is given this, as he looks forward to our day, I think, those seven churches span uh, the history of the church age, and each of the churches is a type and a symbol. The churches are linear in time, but they are rotational as well. That is to say, uh, what one church does, the church of Ephesus, uh, actually began back in the days when John wrote this. John uh, was the bishop of Ephesus, by the way, until he died. But the Ephesian church shall we say, has rotational patterns that bridge time and space all the way, if you will, to the present day. And each of those seven churches is linear, that is they cross history, but they're also rotational. Uh, the churches are circular, just as, as you see them on a map, if you look at a map of uh, Asia Minor. And so the church has become the archetype of the church, the body of Christ. This begins, and, and by the way, I have run out of time, sadly. There's a lot more I can say about the first chapter of Revelation. Why is it important? To me, it's important because the Apostle John, who walked with, with Jesus before his resurrection, suddenly sees God. And I think all of us need to follow that same pattern. Uh, you, you, you read about Jesus, uh, he, a very loving person, a very circumspect person, the wisest person who's ever walked the face of the earth, but he's also God. And we're going to have to stop there. I wish we had more time. I'm Gary Stearman. Hey, keep watching everybody. We are. We're so glad that you joined us this week. We hope that this message was a blessing to you and we look forward to seeing you next week, whether it's here, there, or in the air.